Working Cows Podcast, episode 154. Welcome to the podcast that gives producers a platform to discuss and share paradigm-challenging practices. Practices that have increased the effectiveness of their operation and the joy that their families have received from this lifestyle. Howdy, everybody. It's Clay Connery, host of the Working Cows podcast here with another episode for you. Really excited to welcome back again uh, Jim Garrish. Short turnaround time between episodes this time. I think we were over 100 episodes between his first and his second appearance, and uh, we're less than a few episodes here uh, between his his second and third. Uh, But he he was there at the, uh, he was featured at the Cornerstone Grazing Regenerative Grazing Workshop. And uh, he piqued my interest, and I wanted to talk to him about the four laws of ecology today. So excited to be uh, joined by Jim Garrish. I do want to remind you of the Colorado six. The Colorado section for the Society of Range Managers uh, webinar series. You can find information about that at the show notes page for today, workingcows.net slash 154. Also at cssrm.org slash webinars. Uh, There will be a link to that and a flyer at the show notes page for today, workingcows.net slash 154. After I'll I'll talk a little bit more about that after my interview with Jim Garrish. So, Jim, thanks for joining me today on the Working Cows podcast. Always a pleasure, Clay. You piqued my interest at the uh, grazing workshop at Cornerstone Grazing. You talked about the four laws of ecology, and I'd like to hear talk about those a little bit more. All right. So this is the four laws of ecology. If you're just kind of a plain guy out on the ranch, it's not for the academics on campus. So here they are. There's no such thing as a free lunch. Water runs downhill. Everything's gotta be somewhere. And mother nature always bats last. I like them. They are, like you said, simple. Uh, I would like to hear you talk about a little bit, which one of those is the biggest barriers to success? Is that order a hierarchy? Do we start from the top? Or is there one of those that is typically a bigger barrier to success for people? Well, um, we'll start on the top of this. In conventional agriculture, well, I'll jump to the bottom. In conventional agriculture, it seems that Mother Nature is the enemy. Hmm. When we work with nature and we're in the regenerative mindset, then it's actually a blessing that Mother Nature always bats last because she will help us fix our mistakes. <laughs> So, but I'll I'll go back to the top. When we say there's no such thing as a free lunch, what we're talking about there is energy flow. You know, starting Mm -hmm. from solar energy, every transaction that takes place in the biological world, there is a cost to it um, in terms of energy. Uh, I think everybody's familiar with the idea of trophic levels, they might not have ever heard of that term, but they're aware that we have plants that carry out photosynthesis, and that's our first capture of energy. And then we have herbivores, which would be the next trophic level down, and those are animals who eat exclusively plants. And there is a, uh, from one trophic level to enough to another, Um, you know, in general science of ecology, we usually say there's only about a 10% energy retention or capture from one trophic level to the other. So when we think about plants capturing solar energy, uh, we got tons and tons and tons of solar. No, we don't have any weight of solar energy doing come coming down. We got photons and photons and photons (laughs) of solar energy coming down, but the plants, even if they're thickly covering the surface of the earth, they don't capture anywhere near all of it. And then the herbivores consume it. And of course, there's all that, uh, you know, belching and farting going on with cows and all of those things are dissipations of energy, carbon dioxide, methane. 
So there's energy leaking out of the grazing animals. So at that level, we have a loss of energy. They didn't get a free lunch. They paid for it. And now we, the omnivores, come along and, you know, we harvest those animals and we consume them. And the same thing uh, in the process of harvesting those animals, cooking those animals, and then us eating those animals, there's energy being dissipated out into the atmosphere. And so we may capture at best 10% of the energy that was contained in the flesh of that animal that we're eating. Hmm. And because I ate so much of that red meat, I'm going to have a heart attack and I'm going to fall over and die. And then I'm going to decompose. And the decomposers, which is the next trophic level down, come and consume me and they burn energy in their process of consuming me. And so as we go from solar energy being captured by plants to the energy that decomposing microbes are getting from me, uh, we have about one ten thousandth of the calories that the plant originally captured <laughs> in the sun that is flowing to those decomposers. So everything in nature, there is an energy cost to it. And our production systems, um, you know, grazing is what I do and talk about. We always have to be focused on, on the front end of this cycle, capturing as much energy as possible, as much solar energy as possible, because we know as it flows through the plants, to the livestock, to the consumers that we're selling our product to, there's just a drain of energy out of the system. So that's sure. the... No such thing as a free lunch. On each one of these, I'd kind of like to get a little bit more of a practical look at it. And how do how do producers, how do grazers, uh, how do traditional ranchers miss the point uh, that there is no free lunch in these in this ecological law? Uh, what are they What are they doing wrong that is inhibiting them to uh, capture or rightly relate to this law? Okay. The, the real um, uh, obvious piece of it, and I do this when we take a class out into the field, and you'll recall this from when we were um, out with the group at Cornerstone, we got in a circle and I told them, look down and at the pasture we're in and visualize how much solar energy are we capturing. And most farms, ranches that I go to, you might drive by on the road and look out across that pasture and wow, it looks like a you know beautiful waving green field. And then we walk out into it and we look straight down into that canopy and the plants are widely scattered. The leaves aren't dense and we see a lot of solar energy just hitting the ground. And I always tell people, and I use the rhetorical you know beef in most of this, that when you see sunlight hitting bare ground, what you should be thinking is, that is a pound of beef I don't have to sell. Mm. It is a missed opportunity. It goes back to we as the managers of the plant community that's covering the landscape, we need to be focused from the begin, very beginning of the, the growing season. How do we capture more solar energy? How do we capture more solar energy? And um, leaving more post-grazing residual allowing appropriate recovery periods that that's the practical application and creating diversity in our plant communities that's the practical application of that law we the whole uh, production system the flow of energy is just a leaky pipe spraying you know water out all over we we lose energy through the entire flow and for us to be you know profitable and to create more organic matter in the soil and to feed more microbes in the soil, we have to start with the focal point of let's capture more solar energy at the top of this train rather than trying to figure out how do we salvage as much as possible at the bottom of the train. I think the the, the more litter answer is is the answer that we were uh, going for there is there more is there anything else that we should be considering or just whatever it takes to have a more efficient solar panel uh, what about introducing other species and things like that is there things that we should look at there 
Yeah, there's certainly a place for that. You know, I talk about broadening biodiversity so that we create a more effective solar panel. The more different types of plants, and in ecological terms, we talk about functional groups, the more different functional groups of plants that we have out there in the pasture, the more days of the year that we're likely to have green growing leaves that can capture uh, solar energy and you know, produce carbon sugars uh, that then flow through the system. But you know, we can at every tropic level be thinking about this. With our grazing animals, we know that at set stocking, we're probably harvesting only 30 and in a very good setting, 40% of the plant biomass that grows on a, uh, a pasture acre. And so we, and we know in a high rainfall environment or under irrigation um, that we can actually harvest 80 to 90% of the biomass, leave the plant stand healthy. Uh, but if we can harvest 80 to 90% of the biomass, that means we're capturing again twice as much energy with our livestock as what set stocking does. When it comes beyond those animals, us harvesting those animals and eating them, well, I never let a bite of meat go to waste. So I'm doing my part <laughs> to capture as much energy from that tropic level above me as I can. Uh, anything else on no such thing as a free lunch uh, that you'd like uh, to... Not, not right now. I'm sure we'll cycle back to it. <laughs> okay. Uh, next one up is water runs downhill. And what what are we talking about here? How do how do we need to be thinking as as good managers of landscapes uh, about this law of ecology? Well, there's several factors here, and the most obvious one we see as we drive around the countryside is all of the soil erosion that takes place because of running water. I don't know how some people don't get it that water is going to run downhill, and if there's nothing to obstruct that flow of water, it just gains a whole lot of head, picks up a lot of dirt and plant debris, and it zooms off down our creek to a river that's a tributary of either the Missouri, the Mississippi, the Columbia, something like that. And we send um, that soil out to the ocean in the case of the Missouri and, well, the whole Mississippi River Basin, the Ohio River, Mississippi, Missouri, all of that. You know, we are contributing every year to the growth and expansion of Louisiana. And as much as I like, you know, Cajun food and, you know, good crawdads and all that, uh, we shouldn't be really be doing that. Right. So everything, as water runs downhill, everything else moves with it. The, the soil, organic matter, the lifeblood of our farms is going away. Um, but the other thing that we have to think about some of that water does infiltrate, which is a downhill movement. Uh, but as it infiltrates downhill, it still has the opportunity to move on the downhill gradient in a subsurface flow. The more organic matter we create in the soil, the more root plant roots we put in the way of that water moving subsurface, uh, the more of it we hold on our property. Another where, place where this comes in specifically with grazing is, and I've, what I, what I've been doing most of the, this day, well, besides, you know, working with the cattle, because we're getting calves weaned today, I've been working on a uh, grazing cell design for a guy up in northern Idaho, and we are basically creating a stock water system that is entirely gravitational. Now we're pumping water uphill to a storage tank and then gravity feeding it back down. And if you do that, and if you have plenty of gradient, you don't have to put every tank in, you know, the lowest spot on the landscape. Now, back in the Midwest, a lot of people, you know, watered out of ponds, or if they were real progressive, they actually had a pipe out of their pond through the dam to a water tank somewhere below. But when you think about water tanks, stock water tanks in a gravity system, most people gravitate, no, yeah, pun intended, most people <laughs> gravitate towards putting that tank in the bottom of a swale or something. They say, well, that's where they're getting the greatest gravitational flow. But when you have a permanent 
stock tank. It is an attractant for livestock grazing. It's the placement of stock water on the landscape that dictates where animals are going to spend most of their time. And when we have water tanks placed in low spots, um, the ant there's always a manure distribution gradient towards water. Animals don't, you know, eat everything way out on the pasture and then pee and, pee and poop way out there on the pasture. Well, they have to come in and get a drink. And so a disproportionate amount of manure ends up gravitating towards the watering point. And if we put all of those watering points low down in the landscape, we are moving all of our nutrients to a lower point in the landscape. And because water only flows downhill and not uphill, we have no natural processes that transport minerals back uphill away from those low gravity supported watering points um, that the livestock are bringing all these nutrients to. So if we can actually place water higher up on the landscape, which very often is pumped pipeline systems, but in this one that I've just been designing, we only have one tank that is actually on the rising side of the pipeline. The other uh, eight permanent tanks and 10 quick coupler water attachment valves are all on the downhill there. But because we have so much fall in this case, I mean, we, we have 300, you know, three, about 320 foot of fall over the course of a two mile pipeline coming back down. So we do not, even though we're using gravity, we can put most of that water actually still fairly high up on the landscape in positions. And so then the livestock are carrying minerals back uphill for us because they're still transporting that, they're, they're transporting manure towards water. So we strategically place our, all of our tanks as high on the landscape as we can so that the cattle carry nutrients back uphill because we know that water, either through surface runoff or subsurface downward flow, is going to um, be moving those nutrients back downhill. And that could bring us into, you know, a whole conversation of key line, you know, plowing and, you know, yeoman's, um, yeoman in Australia, his approach to um, landscape planning and using that key line plow. And that is designed to hold water higher up on the landscape, spreading it away from soil. So that sur subsurface flow is always moving water towards swales. And what a key line system does, it steers uh, downslope moving water back away from the swales. Hmm. Now, eventually it's going to swing back down. But the whole idea is fighting that battle against the general idea that water runs downhill. You've got to hold it high on the landscape. Yep. I've never seen one of those in action. I've just seen people talk about using them. And I've always wondered in a in a pretty dense, hard soil like I live on, how big of a tractor would I need to pull something like that? <laughs> I am known as a guy who's not a fan of equipment. Um, the only, I, I really like heavy, heavy metal music, <laughs> but I don't like heavy metal equipment. Um, the key line plow, the yeoman plow is one of the, and I have been a, seen it work. I've been on places where it's been done. It is one of the few pieces of heavy metal equipment that I think actually makes sense and can probably be cost justified. Hmm. Not in every environment. There has to be a certain base level of productivity in the, the land, in that precipitation regime for it to pay off doing. Uh, there, there are certainly areas where the land is so poor the precipitation amount so low that the cost of doing um, uh, key line plowing probably would not pay but you get to um, I don't know probably 14 14 16 inch precipitation regimes and I think in most situations we can show that it would be a um, that the cost benefit ratio would be positive there's certain locations and situations where less than 14 inches, it's you know probably still going, to, still going to be useful, but there is a lower limit of water availability that makes it feasible. 
Something. And I and I and I suppose it's one of those things you know you need to be strategic in how you use it as far as matching its intended use to the landscape that you're on so that it's accomplishing what it was designed to yeah. to uh, do. Right. And as far as how many horse does it take per shank, I knew that number off the top of my head once, but I don't remember it. <laughs> gotcha. It's something anybody can look up. How yep. many horses do you need for one yeoman shank? Huh. Interesting. Uh, and then uh, everything has to be somewhere is the next is the next law of ecology. Am I right? Yep. Everything has to be somewhere. And, you know, we can a lot of ways to think about this one also. But uh, as I think about conventional farming, you know, it is all the pollutants and contamination that comes to mind. Um, we apply things to the soil and they just don't ma magically disappear. Either the original compound, it's metabolites, they are somewhere in that ecosystem. Um, they do not go away. And the fact we can take the, everything has to be somewhere to uh, animals, whether we're talking about fish, mammals, humans, uh, we accumulate certain toxins in our fat, the uh, mercury poisoning and, you know, ocean going salmon is a, uh, a classic example. Where did that mercury come from? A lot of different places. Where did it go? Well, it had to go somewhere. And if it happens to end up in the um, fat of salmon or anchovies or, you know, any other uh, fish that's there, everything has to be somewhere. The metabolites of Roundup have to be somewhere. The um, heavy metals that come with sewage sludge have to be somewhere uh we have to be somewhere <laughs> our critters have to be somewhere all of those insects other invertebrates that inhabit the soil and the plant community above it uh, they have to be somewhere if we start tearing down a piece of the ecosystem that is their habitat either they're not going to be there because they're dead or they move away from the habitat that we have altered into some other place. And if that some other place is a particularly delicious crop, well, we just haven't, we've just done our farming neighbor a disfavor. And you know what, the vice versa, you know, happens a lot also. That cropland pests that we normally wouldn't see in grasslands, they show up, we get them. Because when a crop gets harvested, they have to be somewhere. Grasshoppers, they have to be somewhere. And unfortunately, uh, very often that somewhere <laughs> is our uh, nicest pasture that they like to come to. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And I guess this one kind of screams at me the unintended consequences. There's There's an unintended consequence for every action. And some of them are good, some of them are bad, and I think um, we've we've for a long time in agriculture just assumed that all of our all there are no unintended consequences essentially for um, you know for anthelmintics and cattle and for uh, you know crop pesticides and herbicides and fungicides and we're coming to see now um, everything is interconnected. Everything has to be somewhere, and uh, there there really is no such thing as an unintended consequence. Um, there, or I mean, there isn't. There isn't well, yeah. any. There's no such thing as as an unintended consequence free action. I guess I should say. Yeah, that that that's exactly right. There's going to be. You know, I describe it as um, you know when we talk about the laws of physics, where every action there's an equal and opposite reaction, things like that. Those are very straightforward. They're very repeatable, and one of the reasons why they're very repeatable is because the action does not change the environment in which we perform that action. Uh, biology is mm. completely different. You know, I say for, and when we do something, apply some force, some energy, or take something away in a biological system, there is a multi-dimensional effect and the organism, you know, we, we talk about it in evolution that the environment creates the organism. But what we didn't realize for a long time and becomes increasingly apparent, and epigenetics is, you know, a very 
uh, key part of this whole view is that the organism is changing the environment on an ongoing basis as well. And, um, you know, we could go down <laughs> and look at a dung beetle and see a dung beetle carrying a piece of manure down into the soil. And um, that is the organism altering its environment in a very minor way. Or we can look at the human beings using fossil fuels, tilling the land, uh, pumping out tons and tons and tons of potentially top toxic chemicals every year. Um, it is absolute uh, foolishness, ignorance of the world around us to say that, oh, we can't affect the environment. We have been altering, human beings have been at a minimum altering the environment for at least 30,000 years because that's about how long uh, anthropologists have been able to identify that people have been starting fires, starting fires to change the grassland environment, to attract herbivores to come in there to a particular area so they're easier to kill, cutting down and burning trees to create a field to do something else in, grow grass and eventually to you know grow wheat, corn, whatever. Um, but, and we carry seeds across wide oceans. <laughs> Not a lot of other species do that. Yeah. But there are some birds do, ducks with little bits of dirt stuck to their feet that happen to have a particular uh, egg of some creature or a seed of some sort. Uh, but humans have done that on, and you know, in these days, we would say an industrial scale. <laughs> we have changed the entire environment through our actions. And, you know, I could certainly say there's some, been some positive aspects of that but there's absolutely some negative aspects of that. Uh, the last one on the list is Mother Nature bats last. And you, you mentioned that uh, in regenerative agriculture, that's good because Mother Nature will uh, maybe cover up some of our mistakes. Um, but then in traditional agriculture, we find ourselves sometimes uh, f trying to run through the brick wall with our head uh, <laughs> because Mother Nature is, is holding up progress when we're trying to fight against her. So uh, what are what are some of the ways that we can work in sync with nature to make sure, uh, or what are some of the indications that Mother Nature is batting last that we can see? Okay. Uh, I'll start by making the comment that there is, I think there's only one force on earth more powerful than the human being for altering the environment, and that is Mother Nature. Um, we are, we as a species, Homo sapien is going to go extinct. Extinct is the rule, not the exception. You know, some people think, oh, the dinosaurs all died. That's horrible. Hey, their time had come. Yeah. It's time for them to go. Uh, every creature that's gone extinct uh, has done so because of, you know, changing environment. And yes, humans have done some of that environmental change that has accelerated the extinction of a lot of species. But um, because existence is dynamic, because everything in the world is always changing, we might not see it in our narrow view of time. But, um, you know, things are changing. We will go extinct. And whoopee-doo, no big deal. Everybody goes extinct. And that, that's what Mother Nature batting last is. Um, ultimately, she will win. Uh, conventional agriculture that battles against nature, conventional medicine that battles against nature, mm. uh, ultimately they will all lose because the greatest force, the most powerful force on the planet is the planet itself. All of the integrated oceans cooling, oceans warming, atmosphere absorbing carbon dioxide or atmosphere releasing carbon dioxide tectonic shifts, um, all of that stuff. Um, we are a small pebble in the grist mill of mother nature. And as, as we've said in regenerative agriculture, mother nature will heal us as long as we recognize 
we should let her take the lead. Um, the, the, the battle that we as a species have waged against nature for a long time, I think more and more people are realizing that um, we human beings, we are a part of nature. We are not apart from nature. We are a mm-hmm. part of nature. Uh, so, I, you know, I, I could make the argument that everything that human beings have ever done has all been natural. You know, it's just part of nature. Unfortunately, it just screws a whole lot more of nature than, um, you know, what most most critters do. Uh, I don't think the elk is going to make anybody else go extinct. Plants, animals, grubs in the soil or anything. I don't think the elk's going to do that. I don't think the rabbit's going to do that. I don't think hummingbirds are going to do that. Um, People can certainly do that because we've amassed this uh, arsenal of technological tools to do battle against nature. Um, So coming back to this idea of letting uh, nature guide us. And, you know, I hear some of the um, regenerative crop farmers you know, who have progressed from conventional farming through chemical supported no-till farming to what they now call no-kill farming, where we have cover crops and those cover crops are either terminated with high intensity grazing or mechanically with a, uh, a roller crimper. Mm-hmm. But they've moved away from um, using chemicals that, you know, create wholesale, you know, death across that entire plant community. You know, I'd say those processes are basically following nature because nature reestablishes uh, annual plants into existing sods and under trees and stuff on an ongoing basis. There is a process by which annuals can compete in, you know, perennial plant communities and this move towards no-kill farming in the regenerative sector. Uh, those people are learning uh, the, the timing, specific impact on the existing plant community, not necessarily fatal, but making an impact on the existing plant community in a real timely manner that allows a particular uh, annual crop to come in there. So um, even within the uh, cropping sector, people are learning to uh, use Mother Nature as a guide. Uh, it is in the grazing sector where I live and work, uh, it is just so easy <laughs> to work with Mother Nature. And, you know, some of the um, you know simple things we talked about, basically rotational grazing, you let animals eat off an area and then you move them. Well, in nature, no wild animal has any motive to stay in a place where it's eating all the food there. In the absence of fences and human communities and stuff, they just went somewhere else. And so in rotational grazing, plant grazing, and, uh, you know, I'll do respect to uh, Alan Savory and hours of semantic arguments I had with him years ago about (laughs) that wording. Yeah, it's still easy to say rotational grazing, and some people have the wrong idea. uh, But, you know, it's burned into 64 years of my existence. (laughs) So, uh, you know, that's a mimicking of nature. Having calves and lambs born on green grass rather than on white snow, that's mimicking nature. Uh, The move towards not weaning calves per se by taking them away from the, you know, cows on a specific date in the fall of the year, but letting the the young stay with their mothers and naturally wean uh, over the winter so that they can learn. Um, you know, how to graze, how to live in the environment. Uh, that's part of mimicking nature. And is there, there are, there are cues, I would assume, that nature is going to give us that will tell us that this is the year or or we can go this deep into the year with our, for, per se, weaning or, you know, there's going to be, every year's different is essentially what I'm, I'm trying to say. And so every year we've got to be willing to say, okay, nature's telling me this, this year, I need to respond to that rather than try to just uh, do some, do some replacement feeding or some of those kinds of things. I'll think about um, cow body condition score. 
in this context. So if we look at wild animals, the elk, the deer, the bison, they, they fatten up through late summer, the fall, go into the winter in good body condition, and they lose body condition over the winter. They use fat. All right. Uh, and then they have their babies on green grass, so they've already, their nutrition has turned up. Uh, they're gaining in body condition uh, as they give birth, as they begin to lactate. And in the case of bison, which have essentially the same um, gestation cycle as our tame bovine, um, you know, they're getting, you know, bred in September, uh, kind of at the end of uh, the summer growing season. So for a long time, you know, in conventional beef operations, cow-calf operations, I was largely, you know, taught and told, and then I was telling people, oh, you need to keep your cows at body congestion score five because we know at that, if they're kept at that level, after they calve, they'll come back to heat, you know, in a reasonable time, and they can get bred 83 days later, and you stay on an annual calving cycle. Um, okay, good, fine, wonderful, but it's expensive, relatively speaking, to never let a cow drop below a body condition score of uh, five. And then kind of in the 90s, some research started showing up, and certainly since the um, uh, start of the 21st century, uh, that shows that a cow who is allowed to cycle her body condition more similar to wild animals you know, let her at the end of winter, let her be, you know, cleared down to low four, even a high three, uh, get on green grass, start gaining weight back. And she might calve as a mid to high four, but she's on a rising plane of nutrition. You know, more recent research suggests that that cow is every bit as fertile in terms of staying on a 365 day calving interval as a cow that was with a lot of expense held to never drop below body condition score five. And then the more interesting uh, research is that a cow who cycles her weight and body condition through the year actually has greater longevity than a cow who is held constantly at a five. And so it just comes back, well, duh, that's the way nature does it with all other ruminant females. Why wouldn't it work for a bovine? Hmm. And we see that it absolutely does. I got a couple of questions here from uh, the private Facebook group, and these are questions that some of them fit more nicely into our topic today than others, but I did want to run through a couple of them. Um, the first one, uh, Adam was at the uh, Cornerstone Grazing uh regenerative grazing workshop and he says crested wheat is looked at as a non-desirable grass by most most in the northern plains in arid arid areas where little to nothing grows would it be favorable to introduce crested instead of living with bare ground is something better than nothing yeah something is better than nothing introducing something that will grow there makes sense now uh when the original prairie was you know, destroyed there. The soil biology that supported that prairie was also destroyed. And th this is why, you know, the idea of, oh, let's just restore the prairies uh, doesn't work is because too many years of farming or abusive grazing has taken away the soil biology. Um, crested wheatgrass is not a native North American plant. It comes from Central Asia, which is really uh, bizarre. Uh, Few years ago when I was in Mongolia and was out, you know, walking on the step, climbing up actually a rocky knoll to, there's a Buddhist temple on, an ancient Buddhist temple site on top of it. And I was climbing up that and say, hey, here's Chris the wheatgrass. Wonder when they planted that. And then I said, oh, they did it. This is where it came from. <laughs> yeah. And so, yeah, I would absolutely rather have crested wheatgrass with all of its shortcomings than I would have than, I, than bare ground. Cheat grass. Cheat grass is a horrible thing to have unless you don't have anything else. Uh, cheat grass is uh, on our mountains here. Uh, I know when the cheat grass greens up because that's when the deer and the elk pellets drop from being, be, change from being brown to being bright green. Mm. Um, 
cheap grass is a horrible thing. It's horrible for wildlife, but I'll guarantee you that if I wander up the mountain while the elk, bull elk are dropping horns, I go to cheap grass patches and I will find horns. Hmm. Because that's what they're eating at that time of year before any of the native grasses are greening up. So Adam, yeah, absolutely. Get some uh, crested wheatgrass. Intermediate, which is another introduced wheatgrass, tends to do well on those same sites and it has a longer productive season than that. Um, those non-native wheat grasses are more affordable seed prices than most of what the natives are. Um, I am not part of the Pure Prairie League. We destroyed the Pure Prairie. Um, we got to get something else back on the ground. So let's put something that grows hmm. and put some of that damn yellow sweet clover with it too, if you want. <laughs> yep. Uh, got another one here. Um, wondering about is pink eye caused by higher legumes in a diet or is it caused by seed heads in your understanding, in your opinion? What do you think? Uh, I think pink eye occurs because the calves have a compromised immune system. Now, what is that due to? Is it uh, high legume content and excess nitrogen in the blood? I don't know. Is it because we're feeding a very simple uh, loose salt farm store trace mineral bag? Um, is it because our personalities are such that our animals always live in terror of us? But, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, I have, I have heard every explanation for pink eye you can think of. And I have heard different individuals state they absolutely knew how to cure pink eye. And it was, let's do cafeteria minerals. Let's, uh, gray straight grasses let's clip the pastures and in any given year any one of them might be right but uh, my belief is if we have fundamentally healthy livestock because all right so livestock are strict you know if we think about stress we have potential for nutritional stress environmental stress social stress and i see a lot of herds where i think all of those are in play and they have respiratory problems, they have pink eye, they have foot rot, they have all kinds of stuff going on. Uh, you can go to some other places, and I describe it as, you know, this place feels right. Mm -hmm. And the livestock there are calm, uh, they got slick coats, they seem to, you know, be happy, and they have very few health problems. So I think it's just like human beings, you take care of your basic, immune system and you're largely going to be healthy you put yourself under all these stress possibilities and you're going to catch every you know potential bug that comes along so when we lived in missouri uh because everybody said you got to clip your pasture, and that was a lot of fescue mm. you got to clip your pastures or you're going to have pink eye um what i eventually learned is it didn't seem to matter whether i clipped them or not either you had pink eye or you didn't and the further we got into, um, you know, life and understanding the interaction of grass, soil, uh, livestock, and humans, the less and less, you know, problems that we had. And uh, it, it, is, it, is, it is a learning experience. And as long as you do what uh, everybody else is doing, I mean, you look around you and if all the neighbors have pink eye foot rot and all this stuff going on and they're telling you, well, you should do this, you should do that. <laughs> it probably has no validity. Do you think that, uh, that it's a calling, uh, criteria, uh, presence of pink eye or, or at least maybe don't keep replacements out of that cow? Yes, I would agree. There's, uh, uh, genetics and epigenetics kind of affects everything. And I didn't do it for pink eye because we actually had pretty minimal pink eye problems back in Missouri, but um, calving difficulty. This was early on when we were doing it. And, you know, I was assisting uh, more calves than I thought was appropriate. And, 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 and I'm not talking about heifers, I'm talking about cows. And I identified a cow line because I, I, our herd 
you know, started from my, I don't know, remember it was 13 or 15 heifers that we bought. And so we had these certain maternal lines in there and like four generations into it, I identified that most of my calving problems were coming from the descendants of one particular original heifer that we bought. We called uh, every female out of that line. So that amounted to just like seven, seven or eight or something. Um, and just about eliminated calving difficulties out of our herd. Yep. Yeah. I, I, I think anything that disappoints you in livestock performance is calling criteria. So you have, you're more widely traveled than I, so I'm going to, I'm going to assume that maybe you know some of these terms from New Zealand that I'm not as familiar with. So we've got a guy who's based in New Zealand, gets about 33 inches of rain a year. Uh, and he says rainfall, 33 inches rainfall, coastal, uh, summer dry is where he's at right now with ungrazed pastures, storing feed. If that if that feed has slowed its growth, is it reasonable to give it a graze to stimulate the growth? It, 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 at, at that level of moisture, 33 inches, yeah. Um, we can get to what I call a stale solar panel. When we allow, it, it's the same thing as over resting. And it is somewhat species dependent. But um, we get to a point where the pasture is sit, just sitting there and you're not adding any more yield to it, it definitely needs to be grazed off at that point. If you got any soil moisture at all, uh, you will get a recovery and you will have uh, better quality feed. So I th think you know that on you know our pastures here, on our pivot pastures, every two weeks I do a pasture inventory estimating available AUDs per acre. And if I do, two successive inventories and there's been no yield increase on that field. I know I got to get the, you know, cows to that part of the pivot and get those paddocks grazed off because I'm making no photosynthetic gain. I'm not adding carbon to the soil. And you know, this is a mistaken notion that some people have that you get these really, really long recovery periods and you're just continuously pumping carbon into the soil. No, you're not. Um, the plant plants are like animals. They have a maintenance requirement. They're living, breathing organisms. They have a maintenance requirement. And the larger the individual plant is, so the longer the recovery, mm. uh, a higher percentage of daily photosynthesis goes to maintenance and not new growth. Mm. And that's maintenance of the root structure and the above ground. We're not flowing new carbon really to the soil doing that. And so we want to graze those pastures off and get them the fresh start, get them back to the active photosynthesis stage. And that's when they're going to be flowing more direct energy to the, the microbes in the ground. Uh, very good stuff. One, one last question uh, from, the, from the group, and I won't limit you or, or tell you how many uh, tips or a piece of, uh, pieces of advice you have to say, but knowing what you know now, what are some pieces of advice you would give yourself if you were just starting out today? Don't waste water. Um, you know, I've, I've said this in different meetings and in some of my writings. So when we left our farm in Missouri in 2004, we were carrying a cow year round, made no hay, fed no hay on 2.05 acres. Hmm. I am confident that I could go back there, run a cow to 1.5 and maybe 1.25 acres. Hmm. Be, just through better water management, better uh, post-grazing residual litter management. Um, I, I've come out here and we have this wonderful thing of center pivot irrigation where I make it rain <laughs> three quarters of an inch every three days as long as the equipment runs. And we also graze out on the desert where our natural precip is less than eight inches a year. And what I've learned in those two extremes that have nothing to do with natural rainfall in Missouri. I've learned so much about plant soil water relationships um, that man, sometimes I just hang my head in shame thinking about all the opportunity I missed back in Missouri when I thought I was doing so well. There's a chapter in my MIG book called, uh, I think it's called walking in the rain or a walk in a walk in the rain where I talk about this and, you know, 
what I saw happening on the neighbor's property, what was happening on our place. Um, and I thought I was doing, you know, a really good job. I wasn't, I had scratched the surface. Hmm. So that's the number one thing. Um, you know, is it, always pay attention, go out in the rain. Every serious grazer needs to be out in precipitation events and at different hmm. times of the year to see what's going on, little ones and big ones, because they can teach you a lot. Um, don't run for the barn or the house when it starts raining. Just stay out there and revel in it and see what's happening because we can learn so much. It's money but, falling from the sky. You might as well enjoy it. That's right. <laughs> you know, the other big thing, um, and we say this is the first mantra for rehabilitation of grazers, <laughs> anonymous, over grazers anonymous, and that is I will have no fear of wasting grass. Hmm. Um, you don't, you, you don't waste grass. The, the, yes, the livestock need to be fed but so does the pasture itself and so does the soil. And so our management should always be focused on uh, taking care of the plants first and the soil and then grazing the livestock is secondary to, to that. If our management focuses on uh, creating healthy plant communities and a functional soil, feeding the cattle will just come along for the ride. So how do we improve the water cycle? Uh, is it, what are, what are some ways to improve the water cycle if we're not going to waste water? Uh, ties right in with uh, having no fear of wasting grass. Um, you got to leave post-grazing residual as much green cover as possible because that keeps the soil underneath cooler. We have to create and maintain a litter layer at the soil surface to insulate that soil to break rainfall impact. Um, you know, this is nothing new. Every, every uh, grazing guru, you know, they, you know, talk about it, but we can't uh, hammer it enough because I go to places where, you know, people have, been to my classes, they've read the books, they've been to Gabe Browns, they've been to Greg Judy's, they've been all these places and you, you go out there in their pasture and you still find spots that are overused, litter is deficient. And, you know, sometimes they're sheepish about it and say, man, I know I need to do better. Sometimes they think they're doing wonderfully and they're not. You gotta waste grass, you gotta waste grass to have a functional water cycle. Very good, very good, and and as always, uh, you go we go a lot longer, but I do want to give you an opportunity to share. Uh, you're you're back on the uh, traveling train and and able to get out and and do some some workshops and some seminars. So I'd like to give you an opportunity to share uh, where you'll be in the near future. Okay, so the next one we come have coming up um, is down near Shreveport, Louisiana. It's actually uh, Bozio City. And it is the Back to Your Roots um, 2020 conference. It is hosted by CAMPTI, that's C-A-M-P-T-I, Field of Dreams. Um, it actually, the whole session actually runs uh, six days from September 8th through the 13th. I'm going to be um, out, on a, um, out on a farm there doing a program on the 10th and the 11th. And it will be a, a combination. We'll have some classroom, but the majority of it, uh, we're going to be out in the field, you know, looking at grazing, talking about, um, you know, the plant soil animal interaction. Um, I don't do a lot of programs in the really deep south like this. Uh, so it's going to be um, a, a fairly unique opportunity for, you know, people in that um, East Texas, Arkansas, Louisiana, Mississippi. Uh, environment and uh, it is uh, it, it is a limited attendance event because of COVID and we're, we're actually doing a a live session but it's all going to also be running virtual um, the live session is capped at 50 people because that's what you know current state uh, governor's guidelines in Louisiana are I mean this this was originally planned uh, well, it was supposed to happen in May, and it got postponed. 
but you know, it was supposed to be a 300 to 400 person conference. Hmm. Uh, that's what they've done in the past, I think. And you know, that's what the objective was. Uh, but because of the COVID restrictions, 50 people is all that can be allowed on site. And I talked to uh, Donna Isaacs, the uh, coordinator uh, yesterday, and they still had, um, you know, openings for the on-site um, part of the program. So, uh, you know, just listeners, just do a search for that uh, Camp D Field of Dreams Back to Your Root Conference for 2020, and you sh- you'll go to the web page and you'll be able to find the registration information and all of that. And actually, Clay, uh, that is the only uh, other program that I have scheduled this year. And we had a whole lot of stuff uh, through the summer, spring, summer uh, that was canceled and things that we thought would happen this fall. uh, Those organizers have said, yeah, we're just going to skip it this year and push it off to next year. Have a hell of a good hunting season, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> I was going to say, are you opposed to changing that? <laughs> are you you open to more gigs between now and the end of the year? Uh, I, I, except in the month of October, because that is my hunting month. But, you know, November, December, I'm, I'm traveling out and I'm doing a lot of consulting. I've okay. got, you know, in conjunction with this trip down to Louisiana, I mean, I'm driving it. I got a 4,500 mile loop drive and I've got 12 consulting stops scheduled on that i'll be on the road uh 20 days and i shouldn't have mentioned that because some other people might call me no (laughs) i cannot add anything else to that trip uh but we expect to be uh uh going in november early december uh you know to see our kids and grandkids who we haven't seen uh, you know basically this year because of not traveling so much but we, we will be making trips to a trip to Missouri and Texas uh, late November, December. And if someone wants to get in touch with me on that and see about scheduling something, yeah, I'm open to it. Okay. Sounds good. Well, uh, I found Campty Field of Dreams, and I'll have a link to that in the show notes page for today. Oh, cool. Working, Thank you. Yep. Workingcows.net slash 154. There will be a link there. So uh, go ahead and, and check that out. And uh, this will be out just a couple of days before that event. But if there's still room, you can get in on it. If not, I think you'll sounds like you'll be able to take part of it virtually. That's exactly right. Sounds good. And believe it or not, after uh, spending three days with you, I still have more questions. Uh, but uh, I, I really appreciate your time today. <laughs> we'll just have to do this again sometime. <laughs> sounds good. Thank you. You're welcome, Clay. Thanks for the opportunity. Good stuff there with Jim. Uh, really uh, wanted to, again promote the Colorado succession. I can't say it. Colorado section for the society of range managers, uh, webinar series, uh, coming up in October and going to be a good time with a lot of, uh, future past uh, guests of the Working Cows podcast, people like Ryan Noble and Dallas Mount, uh, talking about peer advisory groups, uh, essentially Executive Link, uh, uh, through the Ranch Management Consultants. Uh, Also, uh, very, very uh, good sessions on range management and different uh, types of seeds and things like that that we can use to improve our ranges and then also uh, building online communities Kathy Voth, Tip Hudson and myself will be doing a session on that and then a a movie night with the Hannah Ranch movie and I will be hosting a uh, post screening Q&A with uh, Maggie Hanna and uh, the, the director Mitch Dickman as well as Kate Greenberg from the Colorado Cattlemen's Agricultural Land Trust. So it'll be a good good time there. Really looking forward to that. And I would encourage you to head on over to cssrm.org slash webinars to get signed up. And really excited for next week. We're going to talk to Justin Rader of 100th Meridian Ranching, and we're going to talk about bull leasing, the benefits of it uh, economically, uh, the benefits benefits of it genetically, all those different things uh, that go into a good bull leasing program and what what that, how that service uh, could be something that maybe you should entertain. So look forward to that uh, n- new episode of the Working Cows podcast coming your way real soon. 
We invite you to visit WorkingCows.net to subscribe to the show via iTunes or Stitcher. You'll also find detailed show notes pages, resources from our guests, and the industry leaders who have influenced them. For more ideas on putting your cows to work for you in a more profitable way, tune in next week. <laughs>